Do not be deceived into thinking that Americans are deeply divided over gun policies. Johns Hopkins research shows the vast majority of people, whether they own guns or not, support universal background checks, testing requirements for concealed carry, and gun violence restraining orders. APM Research Lab's work shows a majority of gun owners and non-gun owners alike support red flag laws. A majority of gun owners support licensing for all gun purchases and safe storage laws. And America need not wonder how those laws might be applied. Just look at Colorado. We have more gun ownership than the national average, and we also have universal background checks, red flag, and safe storage. Marshall Zellinger starts us off tonight with Colorado's newly passed, but little talked about gun legislation, and why a ban on so-called assault weapons is not under consideration. The moment after that shooting in Boulder, we didn't say we're going to do X, Y, and Z, this is our moment. We said we're going to listen to the community and the experts and do what we think is going to save the most lives. Democratic Senate President Steve Fenberg represents Boulder. Following last year's King Super shooting, the legislature passed several gun-related bills. One prevented people with certain violent misdemeanors from passing a background check. Another bill gave local governments control on passing gun-related ordinances. It was in response to a judge overturning Boulder's ban on assault weapons. It's going to look different in Boulder as it does in Denver versus Sterling or Grand Junction. And I don't think we should always rely on a state law to apply to all of those different communities. We could pass an assault weapon ban at the state level. I support that. But is that going to save the most lives? Probably not, given the fact that we are just one state. There are probably tens of thousands of assault weapons already here, and you can drive an hour and a half north and purchase them. Democrats currently control the state house, Senate, and the governor's office. But with an election in November, did the Democrats miss their window to pass whatever they wanted while they could? I actually think we have pursued what we think the, the, the experts tell us is going to save the most lives. Just two months ago, the legislature passed a bill banning the open carry of guns within 100 feet of a polling place. I asked Fenberg what Democrats may try to pass if still in charge next year. There could be more conversations around what are places that are sacred that we should not have uh, mass killing uh, weapons at because they intimidate people or potentially even put people in grave danger. There are conversations around um, who is liable after a horrible event occurs. I think that's been an ongoing legal conversation. It's something that I'm in, in, uh, interested in discussing more. These policies, again, are only gonna go so far unless they are paired with very significant investments in behavioral health. Behavioral health, mental health, that's the area where Democrats and Republicans can perhaps work without as much conflict. Another bill passed in 2021 is the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. I'm working on getting more information about this office and what it's done so far in the year that it's existed. They're supposed to look at this situation with gun violence from a public health and from a data standpoint. Yeah, which is something that the federal government has long been restricted from doing, mm -hmm. looking at gun violence as a public health issue. It strikes me, Marshall, that either these efforts are reactive after something terrible happens or there's an attempt to be proactive. And I, I look at some of the bills as reactive or proactive. I didn't even mention lost and stolen firearms. You're supposed to report it if it's lost or stolen uh, and safe storage of firearms. But, but you find out about that after a crime has been committed. You find out someone perhaps didn't report their firearm stolen, or you find out after the fact, oh, it wasn't safely stored. So I consider some of that legislation, it's educational and gets people in, in a better practice, but usually they're charged after a crime has occurred. Mm -hmm. Marshall, thank you. We know that there are more guns than there are adults in Colorado, more than 3 million guns, estimates say. Despite all the fear-mongering that the red flag gun law would be abused to seize guns left and right, in the first two years of the law, 146 people had their guns taken away. And in almost 80% of those cases, people were eligible to get the guns back or to buy new weapons. Extreme risk protection orders allow somebody to petition a court to remove guns from somebody who's a threat to themselves or others. Let's look at what actually happened by the numbers. Under the law, the court can order guns seized for 14 days or 364 days. As of today, 30 
of the extreme risk protection orders issued in 2020 and 2021 are still in place. It's possible some haven't expired yet or those red flag orders expired and re renewed by a judge for another 364 days. The orders are extended only in rare cases. Only 13 extension requests and only eight times that have been granted. As of today, 116 of the 146 people who lost their guns got them back. We talked yesterday about how desperate some are to shift the focus away from the easy access to guns in America. Arm the security at schools is one thing that you'll hear. Well, initial reports out of Texas are that the shooter got past as many as three armed officers. Well, then arm the teachers, you'll hear. A next viewer, teacher, and Katie Austin reached out to us about that idea of simultaneously trying to teach our children while preparing to draw a weapon and fire on a current or former student if she deems them to be a threat. In her words, not my job. She also wrestles with what it's like to tell kids that they are safe at school when that's not always true. I was five miles away from Columbine, less than five miles away. When it happened, I was in first grade. Um, I distinctly remember the helicopters flying over. I remember going out to recess in the days following and there was a police officer outside standing on the corner of the playground, resting his hand on his hol holster. A few years later, there was the shooting at Platte Canyon High School um, that killed one, and her father actually started what we now know as our lockdown drills and all the safety drills that we have. And my middle school was one of the first schools to go through that. Fast forward a few years later, it was Aurora. I distinctly remember coming downstairs in the morning and my mom standing there with the news on, just crying and saying that 12 people had died. I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher. I went to school to become a teacher. And I started teaching. And nothing prepares you for having those lockdown drills and sitting down with the kids and having them ask questions like, well, what if I'm in the bathroom? What do I do? What if I'm outside and they're outside? What if, what if, what if? It, they have so many questions. Last night when I got home, I started looking at the pictures and I realized that these could be my kids. This could be our school. What's to say it's not going to happen here? I don't know the answer, but something has to change because we can't continue going day to day with this continuing to happen and saying, this is unbelievable. It's not, it's happened every year. This is not something that is different. It's not something that's new. And if we don't do something about it, it's gonna to continue to happen. Bells rang through Denver's Park Hill neighborhood today. They ring each week for George Floyd and they've rung for two years now. Worshippers at UMC Park Hill and Temple Micah share the same space, and they share this Monday tradition, ringing bells at noon on Montview Boulevard. Nine minutes and 28 seconds, the amount of time that George Floyd spent under the knee of his murderer, former officer Derek Chauvin. This week's bell ringing was moved from Monday to Wednesday to coincide with two years since Floyd's murder, to serve as a public reminder that racial justice persists in our community and in our country. They told us that they will continue ringing the bells together at noon each Monday. Anyone is welcome to join. Possession of more than a gram of something that contains fentanyl in the state of Colorado is now a felony, even if people just have a trace of fentanyl inside another substance, and even if they're not aware they have it. Democratic Governor Jared Polis signed the fentanyl crackdown into law this afternoon. Coloradans charged with a felony will have the chance to argue at trial that they didn't know that they had fentanyl and try to reduce that charge from a felony to a misdemeanor. Even the bill's sponsor, Democratic Speaker of the House Alec Garnett, admitted here on Next that the vast majority of people hit with a fentanyl felony won't ever get to a trial due to plea deals. We will pause this coming Memorial Day weekend to remember those who have given their lives for this country. There are families in Colorado who do not need a day dedicated to remembrance, and there's a nonprofit that's dedicated to standing by those families. This week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign supports Angels of America's Fallen, a nonprofit out of Colorado Springs that works with young people and families across our state. 
They honor fallen military and first responders as well by supporting the dreams of their children, whatever they're into, sports, music, the art, whatever is their passion, Angels promises that they will foot the bill for it every year until they turn 18. And they pair these kids with mentors to encourage them to follow their dreams and also to look out for their mental health. Young Coloradans who have lost a parent who was in the military or who was a first responder, they're at greater risk for depression, substance abuse, suicide. Angels makes a commitment to each family, a bond, a bond that lasts years all the way through the kids' school years. In recent years, they have children who have often lost their parents either to suicide after or during their service or as the result of chemical exposure during their service. Beyond just paying the bills for their childhood passions, Angels provides peer support for surviving spouses and families. Our donations will be used just within the state of Colorado to keep that multi-year promise that they've made to families and also to allow Angels to bring some new families off of a waiting list. If you scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, we'll send you that link to donate. We know that even $5 matters, so I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. Their parents served our nation and our communities. In honor of their service, we can stand with their families. What would slowing down climate change look like in our state? Cleaner air? fewer fires, an abundant water supply. We have to believe that all of this is achievable because otherwise, truly, it would be very hard to do your job every day if you didn't have hope. And it's a sign that your sharp eye is going to get fixed ASAP. Next. One of the toughest things about talking climate change is that the impacts often take decades to unfold before our eyes. And it's difficult to picture success. Arnusha Roy takes a look through a hopeful lens and whether that reality is within reach. Looking into the future through MSU Denver affiliate professor Lauren Gifford's eyes. We'll be driving electric cars. Um, you know, hopefully RTD can expand. It reveals a Colorado with yards home to more native plants that are drought resistant and zero scaping with rocks. Are appropriate for the Front Range and appropriate for a future with less access to water. And it makes the bees happy too. And a state relying mostly on renewable energy like wind and solar. This vision of a climate hopeful Colorado is similar among all the experts we talked with, including Grace Rink with the city of Denver, who said success depends on other cities and changes from the Fed. Emissions from vehicles is really controlled by the federal government. If it all works, we will see improvements in air quality. We will see fewer days of extreme heat than what are predicted. I can't say that we would necessarily see less than we are having now. The focus is to stop it from getting worse. And while it is a long to-do list. Yes, that is in our grasp. Scott Denning at CSU is optimistic because of what's at stake. Well, sure hope so, um, because the, the alternative is grim. This is where we can all take a deep breath. There is a lot of work to do, but the experts are taking comfort in the changes already happening. Here in Colorado, um, solar and wind power are are cheaper and not just a little bit cheaper, but like by by half. Denver now requires buildings more than 25,000 square feet to have nearly net zero emissions by 2040. Fort Collins is charging towards relying on renewable electricity by 2030. The number of uh, of announcements coming out about new kinds of you know EV cars or charging stations being added. And while our individual actions do matter, so does the bigger picture. Pressure on the individual is is not helpful. Right, that an individual can only work within the system that we provide for them. And so I don't want people feeling guilty about driving their car to the grocery store if there isn't another viable way for them to do that. So the experts are calling it the energy transition, and all of this is going to mean supporting communities that rely on fossil fuels right now because these kinds of changes can impact their budget for schools, for their roads, ambulances, their tax dollars. So it require having that infrastructure and that support in place for these communities, a lot of it coming down to money. The city of Denver is saying, yeah, they don't have the billions in the bank to spend on this, so they are trying to just be smart with the money that they do have. And where are we today in the renewable energy transition? 
So just over a third of the electricity in Colorado right now is coming from solar and wind. So obviously that's going to need to be scaled way up to meet the demands and what the climate experts are hoping for. There's a lot of really smart people working on how do you get around the fact that it's not windy or sunny 24 seven. How do you get that energy from one part of Colorado to another? And so there are a lot of infrastructure questions that are coming along with this as well that would have to be built in for this to really become a reality. Uh, storage technology is going to be so, so key, so key. Uh, now and decades into the future. Anusha, thank you. A Coloradan on trial accused of fleecing Americans with plans to build a border wall, then pocketing the money. And this is either some of the strongest wind we've ever seen or a real stupid prank that could have gotten someone killed. It's a sign it shouldn't be like this. Next. Prosecutors say a Coloradan lied to President Trump's supporters, telling them that all their donations to his group would be used to privately fund and build Trump's border wall with Mexico. The trial began in New York this week for Timothy Shea from Castle Rock. He is the last defendant standing in the We Build the Wall fundraiser investigation. Because former President Trump pardoned his ex-advisor, Steve Bannon, who was mixed up in the project, and two other people pleaded guilty last month to wire fraud and false tax return charges. The We Build the Wall campaign brought in more than $25 million. The organizers had promised to put the money toward building the border wall. Prosecutors say that Shea from Castle Rock and the other three pocketed hundreds of thousands of dollars for themselves. It's a sign of killer winds in southern Colorado causing a potentially dangerous situation. Next viewer was driving I-25 between Pueblo and Walsenburg when all of a sudden he's seeing this do not enter sign. That makes no sense because he's already on the interstate. CDOT says it looks like the sign actually got turned around by the wind. It's meant to alert people using the median crossover nearby so they don't accidentally turn into oncoming traffic. CDOT sent somebody out to fix the sign because you said something about the sign. If you ever see anything that seems off and could use an explanation, snap a photo and email it to next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. I hope you had a chance to get outdoors and enjoy the beautiful blue skies, the sunshine, the warmer temperatures. Seasonal highs today in the 60s and 70s. These numbers will go 10 degrees higher tomorrow. This warm weather trend is going to continue right into the holiday weekend. Showers and thunderstorms will be a problem for travelers off to the east of Colorado, but we've just got a few high clouds coming in. Temperatures will be mild in the 40s overnight tonight and then soar above average for the next few days. Low 80s Thursday, close to 90 Friday, beautiful Saturday. We put a few thunderstorms in Sunday afternoon and for the holiday Monday. It doesn't mean a rain out or a washout, but if you're hiking and biking, keep an eye out for lightning. The children of Colorado's fallen first responders and military have an ally all the way through childhood. Somebody who shows up for them time and time again with support and financial help to make their dreams come true. We can support them together. What's your feedback next? When we think of families that have lost someone in the line of duty or in service to our country, the image is often that of the empty seat at the dinner table. It's also an empty space on the soccer sideline, an empty seat at the ballet recital, one fewer set of ears listening to a kid sing a solo. A nonprofit in Colorado supports and pays for the childhood passions, art, music, sports of kids who have lost a first responder or military parent. If you scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I'll send you the link to join me in donating to Angels of America's Fallen. Every dollar that we raise will stay in the state of Colorado to help meet their multi-year commitment to stand by these families and these kids and to bring more families and kids off of their wait list and into this program that supports them all the way up through the age of 18. Jay writes, guys, just wanted to express some gratitude for the reporting on the massacre in Texas. Says too often, reports and reporters get wrapped up in their opinions. Last night's reporting was focused on data and fact, which is more of what we need. It's amazing, Jay, how many people thought the data and fact that they didn't like was actually an opinion. We'll see you next time.